If you've ever been to part of a wedding party, at least in the United States or Europe, you may have heard someone tell the bride she needs something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue for her wedding day. This popular tradition, which drives many wedding parties to make an effort to actually find something old, something new to their bridal ensemble, or as well, along with something borrowed and something blue, this all stems from an old rhyme that goes all the way back to 1894, the late Victorian period. Originally, it was listed as a Puritan marriage custom, and in fact, the original rhyme goes like this. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and the last line, and a sixpence in her shoe. In this rhyme, by the way, something old symbolizes continuity, something new symbolizes hope, something borrowed symbolizes friendship, something blue symbolizes faithfulness or fidelity, and for those who are wondering, who are curious, a sixpence was a silver coin, and so a sixpence in her shoe symbolized prosperity. Now, this rhyme comes to mind today as we open up to the Gospel of Luke and read about another encounter between Jesus and the religious leaders. Once again, the religious leaders have a few questions for Jesus, and Jesus is going to answer their questions by way of an analogy and a few pictures. The analogy Jesus will use is relating life with God to that of a wedding. It's an analogy that actually is repeated often in the Bible for characterizing God's relationship with us. Today, through the analogy of a wedding and a few clever images, Jesus is going to speak to us about something old and something new. Now, some people say, some people say, out with the old and in with the new, whereas others believe the old ways, what's tried and true, are always the best. But contrary to what's often taught about this passage and the gospel, Jesus isn't going to pick a side in this argument. No, if we listen carefully, just like that rhyme, that wedding rhyme, Jesus is going to make the case for both, appreciating the old while also embracing the new, recognizing the purpose of the continuity of the past in order to prepare us for the hope, the new, of the future. Let's listen to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. Today's scripture is from Luke, chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days... They will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they'll have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the wineskins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say, the old is better. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage is actually the continuation of an encounter that Pastor Drew preached about two weeks ago. When Jesus called Levi, who we know better as Matthew, to come and follow him as one of his disciples. Do you remember that story? Well, you might remember that Levi, Matthew, was so impacted by meeting Jesus, apparently so excited by Jesus' invitation and the opportunity to leave his days working for the Roman government behind him, he was so excited that he threw a huge dinner party for Jesus to which he invited all his former co-workers, his fellow tax collectors. However, you might also recall the religious leadership, which continues to closely monitor Jesus' movements and teaching. The religious leadership did not take kindly to Jesus breaking bread with those types of people, you know, flagrant sinners. And unable to remain silent on this point, the religious leadership lodged a formal complaint directing their ire not at Jesus, but towards his disciples. But do you remember? Jesus refused to be triangulated. And so Jesus answers them directly, and he says these words. Do you remember it? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, initially, this appears to be one of those drop-the-mic moments for Jesus. I mean, <laughs> the religious leaders have been appropriately humbled and silenced in their sense of self-assurance even as they have been challenged to recognize and confess their own need for healing and forgiveness. 
Seems like a drop the mic moment, but as we've just learned, the Pharisees and teachers of the law do not walk away quietly in a spirit of introspection and repentance. No, they double down in their criticism as they now directly address Jesus with yet another disapproving question. Pivoting away from grousing about the company Jesus keeps, the religious leaders now grumble about how Jesus practices the faith. And their indictment comes by way of comparison. A little background. As with everything in Judaism, there were set forms and guidelines that had been established detailing how a rabbi should train his disciples. One of the most common practices for a disciple, a student of the faith of Israel, one of the most clear expressions of one's reliance upon Yahweh, the one true and living God, was the spiritual practice of fasting. Now, for those of us who are unfamiliar with this, fasting is a spiritual practice wherein one abstains from something, usually food, in order to fuel one's spiritual thirst and hunger for God. One of the insights that can be gleaned from the practice of fasting is our identification of the various stuff that we consume on a regular basis, stuff like food, alcohol, drugs, shopping, social media content, gossip, negativity, criticism, any of the appetites and habits that we have that rival, that eclipse, and therefore have become idols we worship instead of hungering, living for, and honoring the Lord. Now, the Pharisees followed the pattern, the tradition, of teaching their disciples to fast regularly. In fact, everyone knew when the Pharisees were fasting because whenever they did so, they marked their heads with ashes. They marked their heads with ashes as a visible sign of their piety for all to see. And even though the Lord had only called the people of Israel to fast just one day a year on what was known as Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the religious leadership had decided and by Jesus' day, the religious leadership had established the tradition of fasting not once a year, but twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays. But Jesus and his disciples aren't following this tradition. A tradition which, did you notice, as the religious leaders point out, even John the Baptist and his disciples regularly observe. Interestingly, in the parallel version of this episode in Matthew's Gospel account, Matthew tells us it's one of the disciples of John the Baptist who asks Jesus this question, why do you and your disciples not fast? Now to be clear, as we read through all four Gospels, we find evidence both that Jesus himself fasted and that he taught his disciples to do the same. So what's being implied in the question put to Jesus is really more of another accusation that's being made against him and his disciple. It's not really a question. In other words, through their liberal posture, their more liberal posture and public actions of doing more eating and drinking than they are abstaining and fasting, Jesus and his disciples are being accused of setting a bad example, a poor witness before others, of not taking their devotion to the Lord seriously. Well, Jesus answers their question. He answers their accusation. He does so by reframing their understanding of who he is and what he is doing. And he does this as he casts his mission and ministry through the analogy of a wedding celebration. Jesus compares himself with the bridegroom and his disciples with the guests of the bridegroom. In fact, an even closer, better translation of what Jesus says here is that his disciples are the assistants of the bridegroom, or what we would say in today's language, the disciples of Jesus were the groomsmen, those who follow or assist the bridegroom in pulling off the wedding. Not coincidentally, as I mentioned at the start of this message, several of the Old Testament prophets utilize the metaphor of marriage to describe the relationship between God and humanity, wherein the people of God were depicted as the bride and the God and God was the bridegroom. Jesus, in associating himself with the bridegroom, is separating himself and those who follow him from the religious establishment. He's separating himself from those who've been keeping the faith He's even separating himself from those like John the Baptist who've been preparing the way for the wedding. What Jesus is saying here is that his mission and ministry, his and his disciples, isn't about maintaining the status quo and simply observing the traditions and practices of the past. No. The mission and ministry of Jesus and his disciples is about the inauguration, the event, the celebration of the promised marriage to which all those traditions and practices were preparatory. Jesus once again presents himself as both the Messiah and God, as the bridegroom who initiates the wedding, as the one who brings the celebration, as the one who comes to redeem. 
to redeem this beautiful yet broken, but still beloved creation. Jesus acknowledges there will be a time for fasting. There will come a time, and that time will come in the space between when Jesus offers his life unto death for all the world and that space before the victory of the resurrection, his resurrection from the grave. But now, Jesus says, as implies as through signs and wonders, as well as revolutionary acts of compassion and grace, Jesus and his bridal party are unveiling the dawn of the kingdom of God, the countdown to the eternal and unbreakable marriage between we who had formerly divorced ourselves from the Lord and the living God who created us in his own image. And so now is the time for feasting, not for fasting. Now is no longer the time for looking to the horizon for the Messiah to come, for the Messiah is here. Now is no longer the time for waiting for God's promised covenant of salvation to be fulfilled because now is the day, today is the day of the long-awaited wedding that is finally dawning. Now is the time, Jesus is saying, to bask in the renewal of fellowship, the redemption of brokenness, the revelation of hope. When the bridegroom arrives, Jesus says, and the celebration of the wedding begins, nobody's fasting. It would be counterintuitive to do so. It would represent not a sign of joy and thanksgiving for the moment, but one of resistance and opposition to the pending marriage. Once again, though, Jesus' response to the religious leadership here is as much of an invitation as it is a rebuke. For as he expands his initial answer to their question by way of three pictures, notice Jesus is inviting those who are still hesitant inviting those who are still waiting and marking time on the sidelines to stop holding back and to enter into the newness of what he is doing, of what he is bringing, of what he is offering. We're going to look at these three illustrations in succession. Then we'll step back and seek to understand what Jesus is trying to communicate. That this is what Jesus intended for us to do, to look at all of these images, the three of them together, rather than apart from each other, that that's what we're supposed to do is hinted at through the repetition of the same phrase every time, no one. Jesus says, no one tears, no one pours, no one after drinking. So let's do it. The first illustration is the most accessible for us today. As Jesus describes an old worn piece of clothing that needs to be mended. For this sort of repair job, we'd patch the torn garment by sewing on a scrap of cloth, a piece of scrap cloth. You know, think of a pair of jeans with a gaping hole in them. However, that's not the repair method Jesus outlines here. Instead, he points to something more absurd, patching the old garment by tearing off and using a piece of fabric from an entirely new article of clothing. And of course, no one would do this because, as Jesus observes, the new piece wouldn't match the old garment. And perhaps even more importantly, trying to fix the old garment by cutting up a perfectly new garment makes them both unwearable. It leaves the new garment with a gaping hole, just like the old piece of clothing. The second illustration Jesus offers involves the pouring and storing of alcohol. And while this picture is similar to the previous one, it needs a little bit more context as what Jesus describes isn't how one starts amassing a wine collection today. <laughs> you see, back then, wine wasn't stored in bottles. It was kept in wineskins. And these wineskins were made from sheep and goat skins. The hide of the deceased animal was worked off the body without cutting into the skins so that the only openings were the orifices where the feet and the head had been. All of these openings, save where the head had been, all of these openings were sewn shut and then the skins were cured. Now, these new wine skins possessed a certain elasticity so that when newly pressed wine was poured into them, and the opening at the neck at the head was tied up airtight, the skin could and would expand as over time gases were released as the wine fermented. Thing is, these wine skins were basically single use only because after the wine was poured out, the wine skin would not shrink back to normal. It would remain fully stretched out to its limit. So if somebody came along and attempted to pour new wine into one of these old wineskins that had lost its suppleness, as the new wine fermented, the old wineskin would eventually stretch past its limit and crack, or it might even burst. And as Jesus observes, both the new wine and the old wineskin would then be ruined. So Jesus says new wine has to be poured into new wineskins. And that leads us to the third picture that Jesus paints. And it's really more of a continuation of the second one as he ret retains the image of wine. 
Now, with the first two illustrations, Jesus champions what's new, but here he concludes his response to, to the religious leaders with the acknowledgement that new wine takes some time to get used to. Old wine generally tastes better than new wine because it's had time to age, because our palates are more familiar, more adjusted to its flavor. People tend to prefer what they know, even if it's incomplete, even if it's past its vintage, rather than to drink, rather than to receive what is completely new to them. So what's the point? What's the point of these three illustrations? What is Jesus trying to tell us? Well, let's start with what Jesus is not saying. Contrary to how this passage is often interpreted, Jesus is not declaring the old ways of Judaism, what is primarily known as the Torah or the law, that they should be abandoned for the sake of some new way of following and worshiping the Lord. I mean, beyond this encounter, Jesus himself will insist he came to affirm and fulfill the Torah or the law, not to abolish it or destroy it. So we must not create a false dichotomy between the law and gospel. Likewise, and more broadly, Jesus also is not declaring or affirming the philosophy of out with the old and in with the new, this notion that custom and tradition should be forgotten or dismissed whenever something new and innovative comes along. No, if we look and if we listen carefully at what Jesus teaches and does, while he presents the good news as something new, he also portrays it as being in continuity with, being anticipated through what came before. So Jesus isn't pitting the old against the new here. Jesus is trying to wake up the religious leaders to the possibility that God doing something new doesn't mean God is changing the rules. God, in doing something new, actually is revealing where all those rules were intended to lead us, how they were preparing us for what God ultimately intended, for what God eternally promised for us all. I mean, rules and laws are good, necessary things. Both provide order and coherence, structure and boundaries. Specifically, God's rules for life, the Torah or the law, reorient us in a broken and chaotic creation. They reorient us as to what is true, what is good, what is holy. The problem is when the rules, the law, become what we worship, when they become what we fixate on, when they become what we're devoted to. This is a problem because this is not the point of the rules or of the law. God didn't give us rules for life. God didn't give us the Ten Commandments so that he could be entertained watching humanity have to jump through a bunch of do's and don'ts. In taking just one of those rules for life, one of the Ten Commandments as an example, Jesus teaches us elsewhere in Scripture that humanity was not made for the law of the Sabbath. Humanity was not made to take a day of rest for God's sake. The Sabbath was made for humanity. The law of the Sabbath was made so we could get a break so that we would rest for our well-being. The Lord gives us rules and laws for life, the Torah, as tools intended to guide and instruct, to lead us out of our brokenness, out of our division and separation, to lead us into healthy, safe, and thriving relationships of mutuality and service. The goal is not following and keeping the rules, the law, for its own sake. A better relationship, the best relationship we can possibly have with God, with ourselves, and with each other, that's the goal. The rules are for the sake of enhancing the relationship. Jesus is trying to help the religious leaders understand all the rules, all the traditions that came before were never meant as an end unto themselves. They were given as a means of preparation. They were provided to keep us moving forward rather than to keep looking back. They were instituted not so that we could take care of ourselves, but so that we would recognize once and for all how great and absolute our need is for God. Because it's not the rules we need. Because the rules can't save us. And it's not the law we need. Because the more we understand the law of God, the more we understand the way things are supposed to be, the more we realize our inability to make that happen, to follow those rules ourselves. It's not the rules we need, it's the relationship. Christianity is not so much about following rules as it is following the relationship. The relationship we can have with God, the relationship we can have with ourselves, the relationship we can have with each other through being in relationship through following Christ. Too many of us have been raised. Too many of us have settled for a patchwork gospel. Instead of having our clothes changed, we keep trying to rip off pieces of the fullness of the gospel of what Jesus is offering in order to patch up the holes in our lives. 
We incessantly labor and toil under the assumption, the conviction, if we could only patch up this one rip in the garment of our character, then our life would be different. It would be better. Truth be told, that's why many of us are here right now. Because we've grown up trying to apply the Sunday, the weekly church attendance patch as the way to cover the gaping holes that remain in our lives. Others of us keep attempting to patch up the holes in our lives by doing things, good things for Jesus, by seeking to be more ethical and moral in how we live our lives. But despite all these patch jobs, it's still the same old garment, right? We remain basically the same person. I mean, the patches, you know, they work for a while. For a while, we're a little more generous. For a while, we're a little more forgiving. For a while, we're a little more compassionate, a better neighbor for a season. And then the patches tear. And then the patches tear and the holes in our tired lives get exposed again. But what Jesus invites us into is not some religious formula of adding or subtracting things from our life in order to get right with God. I mean, sure, we can try and subtract certain obvious sins from our lives. We can try to add certain obvious good deeds in their place. However, when we do the math, when all those additions and subtractions have been made, again, the sum of who we are remains unchanged. We're still the same old person, rather than the new creation we are meant to become in Christ. Beloved, Jesus didn't come to patch up our character. Jesus came to transform our character. Jesus came to change our clothes. Jesus came to change our mindset, our outlook, our posture, our engagement with each other. We misunderstand and we misrepresent the gospel if all we perceive it to be is Jesus coming to pour a little new wine into our lives, a little drop of goodness, a little shot of courage, a cup of love, a taste of hope. Jesus has not come to add the new wine of the kingdom of God into the wineskins of our old former lives. Once again, Following Jesus isn't about adding things to our lives, Bible study, prayer, church membership, charitable service, and so forth, as good as those things might be. Merely adding things to the old wineskin of an otherwise unchanged and empty life doesn't fill us up and make us feel better. It eventually leads to us becoming more exhausted and overwhelmed until we burn out. Or like those old wineskins Jesus described, we inevitably crack and burst from all the pressure. This is the point Jesus is making to the religious leadership. The full and abundant life God seeks to give to us is not about the things we add or remove from our lives because the truth is, on our own, we can't remove all the dead things that weigh us down in life. On our own, despite all the moral things we may add to the surface of our lives, we can't change deep down who we are apart from God. Bro broken, flawed, inconsistent, self-centered people. We need an extreme makeover that only Jesus can provide. The whole garment of our lives needs to be changed. We need to become a new wineskin. We must be born again, born from above. We need a new spirit. We need to be transformed in a way only the Holy Spirit can cultivate, gradually softening and removing our hearts of stone and transplanting them with a new supple heart of flesh that mirrors the very heart of God. Following Jesus is not about us reshaping ourselves, but about Christ reshaping us. How we see God, how we perceive ourselves, how we recognize each other, how we think, how we speak, how we act. It's Christ reshaping and reforming us so that we can receive, so that we can hold and pour out the new wine of the kingdom of God. And what is this new wine, which just can't be merely added to our lives, but for and through which our lives are changed? In a word, this new wine is grace. Grace is the new wine. Grace is the new wine that is greater than all of our sin. Grace is the new wine that cannot be contained, that bursts out of any old wineskins that persist in being shaped out of guilt and shame. But like Jesus observes, the new wine that is grace can take some getting used to. After all, grace involves change. It involves being changed by God, and most of us don't like change. Some of us don't want to change. A lot of us believe we can't change. But the fact remains that change is a difficult but inevitable experience of life. Not all change is good. Not all change is necessary. 
But here's the thing, <laughs> there is just no way around this. The gospel is all about change. If we believe the Christian life is simply saying a prayer so that we'll go to heaven when we die, but never having to have our lives changed here and now, I'm here to tell you, we're, we've heard and we're sharing the wrong gospel. We're sharing a false gospel. The gospel is that we need to be changed, that our perspective on God needs changing, that how we relate to each other desperately requires change, that this world, that all creation is groaning for change. And this is what Jesus comes to inaugurate. Real, meaningful, deep change. The eternal transformation of all things, including us. The Christian life is a journey of change, of being changed. Or as the Apostle Paul once wrote, from glory to glory into the image of Christ. But again, despite all this, the new wine of grace still can be hard for some of us to swallow. I mean, for people who live and die by the rules, grace is unsettling. Because it's easy to become addicted to the false comfort, the false security of regulations and boundaries, the false sense of power and superiority that can come from judging and condemning others. For those who strive to be perfect and to demand others likewise meet that standard of perfection, grace can be very unsatisfying, more of an annoyance, more of an excuse than it is an encouragement. And grace does not mix well with those who refuse to let go of their anger and resentment. Because the forgiveness out of which grace is harvested, it leaves a bitter taste in the mouth of those who continue to nurse grudges, who insistently demand on their pound of flesh. When we're used to living only by the rules, when we're used to living only according to the letter of the law, grace is definitely an acquired taste. But again, grace doesn't negate the need for the rules, for the law. Grace reminds us all the rules, the law, was never intended to become an end unto itself. The rules, the law, were intended to point us, to lead us into a deeper, fuller, complete relationship with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father, and by extension, a deeper, more complete relationship with ourselves and with each other. Grace doesn't negate the rules or the law. Grace takes us beyond the limits of the rules and the law. Grace takes us into the highest and most beautiful of all rules and law, the law of unconditional divine love, the summation of the law according to Christ. When all we have are the rules, when all we have is the law, all we have is a lot of guilt and shame. All we manifest is a lot of finger pointing and name calling. There's no room for differences. There's no room for disagreement. There's no room for mercy. When all we have is the rules and the law, all we cultivate is criticism and condemnation. But when we have grace in the midst of all the rules, the law, there is more room for us all to breathe more freely. There's more room for openness and wonder. There's more room for forgiveness and reconciliation, even as we disagree, even as we hurt each other. There's more room for love and mercy. Love and mercy expressed not out of fear for self-protection, but love and mercy truly born of selfless and honest compassion for others. My friends, are we settling for a patchwork religion rather than a relationship with Jesus? Are we struggling to receive the new wine of God's grace because we continue to resist being changed, to have the old wineskin of our lives exchanged for the new life Christ offers to us? Beloved, by themselves, all the rules and the law can't change us the way that we need to be changed. And we're all well-practiced at going through the motions of trying to show others what they need to see to label us good. We can even try to fool ourselves by giving the appearance of change for the better without actually changing anything inside. Guilt, shame, and punishment may lead to our compliance. They may lead to our external obedience. But we all know that's not the same thing as internalizing God's rules for life. Rules, again, God gives for our mutual benefit, not his. And our creator knows this. And that's why giving us the rules, the law, was never, was never the master plan of our creator. That's why God doesn't come down in Christ and hand us a list of things to do but instead repeatedly invites and beckons us to come and follow me, to learn from Jesus, to receive from Christ the grace that fulfills the law, the grace that enables us to live the full, abundant life that God always intended for humanity. 
Beloved, only Christ, only Jesus can change us for the good. Only Jesus, only Christ can change all creation for the better. Only Jesus, only Christ, the bridegroom, can deliver the wedding, the marriage that God promises to us all. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.